When folks ask me why I wrote A Brave Vessel, I tell them that it really um, doesn't get much better than this for an historian because it's really two stories in one. Number one, it's uh, one of the most dramatic and uh, um, well-documented adventure, maritime adventure stories of the era, and that is thanks to William Strachey. And second, it's really a fascinating detective story in uh, the discovery of the correlations between the accounts of the wreck that got back to England and William Shakespeare's The Tempest. The story opens in London, spring of 1609. Um, the city is a growing one. There's about 150,000 people there. It'll soon be a quarter million. Um, just about every week, um, 15,000 people go to the theater. It's the main uh, entertainment of the city. Um, in the spring of 1609, however, the uh, theaters are closed because the city is in the midst of a plague ec epidemic. And most people who could have fled to the countryside, including William Strachey and William Shakespeare. Now, Shakespeare is 45. He's nearing retirement. And uh, the plague has uh, closed the theaters and cost him some money, so he's looking for the subject of a new play so that he might uh, afford the uh, mansion house he's been looking at in Stratford-upon-Avon. William Strachey, age 37, is a struggling poet. Um, he, he would like to write poetry. He'd like to write travel narratives. He spent a decade in London trying to find a patron, um, trying to get people interested in his work. It's not been too successful. He's worked through his inheritance, um, and that's about all he's gotten. Um, they probably knew each other, the two Williams. There's um, one literary connection that we know of. In uh, 1604, William Strachey was offered the opportunity to write an opening sonnet, an introductory sonnet for the published version of Ben Jonson's play, Sejanus. And this he did, and uh, it gained him some compliments of his friends, but not much else. Um, but one thing that did occur was that uh, William Shakespeare apparently borrowed a line from that sonnet when he wrote King Lear. Um, both Lear and the sonnet talk of uh, storm, a storm imagery is, is um, surprisingly enough what they they both share in this regard. They talk of swift lightning and ruinous blasts of thunder. It seems that both Shakespeare and Strachey were fond of uh, storm imagery. Now, the two Williams were remarkably alike in a lot of ways. They both left family, families in the countryside. William Shakespeare left his uh, two surviving daughters and his wife, and William Strachey left his two sons. They both had modest mid-level educations, um, which consisted at that time of reading the classics. Um, their families had both recently come into wealth through the uh, wool industry. And they had both gone to London to uh, sell their writing. But I guess in the most important way, they couldn't be more different. William Strachey was virtually unknown. William Shakespeare was renowned throughout the land. Now, besides the uh, plague in uh, 1609, May of 1609, the other thing happening in the city of London was the uh, Virginia colony. Um, now, the Spanish had uh, been going back and forth in the New World quite often and bringing back lots of treasure, and the English were interested in getting in on the game. They had founded um, Jamestown in the Virginia colony about two years earlier. And the Virginia Company of London had blanketed the city with promotional tracks. The stage shows were parodying Jamestown. And so whether you um, supported or derided the venture, you certainly knew about it. And in May of, of that year, there was a new supply convoy that was about to head out to Jamestown. It was nine vessels. It was going to carry about 600 people. The flagship was the Sea Venture. And uh, it was on this ship that uh, William Strachey decided to travel to the New World 
hopefully to get his chance to uh, write the travel narrative that he hoped all England would want to read. The fleet set sail on uh, May 15th, and after stops in uh, Plymouth and Falmouth, it headed out to sea. It was a pleasant sail for about two months. There were opportunities, if the ships were be calm, to uh, take a dip or to uh, grab a smoke out on the gallery balcony, the back of the ship. Now, plague and heat, st heat stroke did uh, strike some of the other ships as they passed through what they called the Torrid Zone, um, but the Sea Venture was disease-free. Now, that pleasant sail would all end on the night of July 24, 1609, when charcoal-colored clouds appeared on the horizon and prompted a night of storm preparations. In the morning of July 25th, dawned with a frightful prospect. Um, a hurricane had overtaken the ship, and the vessel, well, and the first thing that, that happened once the storm came upon the uh, fleet was to scatter it, and each, each of the vessels would fight the storm on, on its own. Now, the sea venture ended up in approximately the 10 o'clock position if the hurricane was a giant clock face. Um, and this caused the admiral of the fleet, who was among the uh, 153 people on the ship, to aim the vessel towards the Caribbean and to start to ride the waves. Now, William Strachey uh, described the storm, and I'd just like to read you a short passage. He said, The sea swelled upon, above the clouds and gave battle unto heaven. It could not be said to rain. The waters like whole rivers did flood the air. What shall I say? Winds and seas were as mad as fury and rage could make them. Now, this was not, this was not a pleasant 24 hours, the first uh, 24 hours of the storm, but it seemed the ship was holding together, and things were going along fine, and they probably wouldn't get too much worse, when in fact they did. A sailor opened a hatch and discovered that there were five to nine feet of water sloshing about in the hold. Now, having a severely leaking ship in the middle of a hurricane is not the best situation to be in. Um, the sailors immediately started looking for the leak using candles. And when they found um, an inflow of water, they used a time-tested method of plugging those leaks. That was to pound strips of dried beef into the, the seam as a uh, temporary um, caulking. Now, no single leak was discovered, but many were, and it turned out that this was really a systemic problem. The oakum, or fiber caulking, that the uh, makers of the ship had pounded into the seams was being pounded out by the storm, and the entire ship was taking on water through all of its seams. The only answer was pumping and bailing, and all the men on board were immediately put to that task, and they would continue it for four days and nights. Now, during the entire course of the storm, Admiral George Summers stood on the, out in the open weather on the poop deck, um, steering the ship. He would call his commands through a grating to the uh, man at the whip staff below. Um, and there he stood or sat for the entire time. And um, captains or, or masters of ships um, in that position were told a specific uh, instruction. They were told not to look behind them because the waves would rise up very high and it could put a fright into even the most seasoned mariner to see these waves. And so it's likely that he did not see the rogue wave that rose just a little bit higher than the others and it swept over the ship, knocking him on his face, covering the ship, ripping off the canvas covers of the uh, the hatchways and filling the ship below and, and also um, knocking people down within the vessel. And Strach described it as, so huge a sea broke upon the poop and quarter upon us as it covered our ship from stern to stem like a garment or a vast cloud. It filled her brim full for a while within from the hatches up to the spar deck. At this point, people thought the ship was going down for sure. Still, they wanted to get up above um, so that they wouldn't be caught in, in a sinking hull. As they scrambled, though, 
it became clear that the ship was in fact still on the surface of the sea. 